Let's give our confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let's greet each other. Let us reform every day. With this, today's message is entitled, A Life Within Grace. Today's message, today is the Sunday that Protestant churches around the world observe as Reformation Sunday. So this was when Martin Luther posted his 95 thesis refuting the unbiblical content held by the Catholic Church at that time on the front door of Badenburg Cathedral in Germany. That was October 31st, 1317, which is why we observe the last Sunday in October as Reformation Sunday. In fact, if Christianity was to be called a religion, then it could be called a religion of reform. Then what is reform? Reform means creating something new. That is what reformation is. And the direction is important. Christian reform, in a word, where are we going from? And where, where, what are we fixing and where are we going to? It means that we are to return to the Bible. What does the Bible say? Not what man says, not what organization says, not what tradition says, not what our stereotypes or prejudice says, but what does the Bible say? It is sola scriptura, scriptura, only the word of God, only the Bible. As we live our lives, we can live a life that is far from the word of God. Sometimes we may say that we live by the word of God, but there are times where we become distant from the word of God. And so to put back it back on the right track is what we call reform. And so you must live a life, a walk of faith that is centered on scriptures, a sermon, a religion, a church centered on the Bible. The church must be centered on the Bible. And that's why from the first moment when I pioneered my church up until now, 37 years later, I've only given messages with, based on the Bible, on Scripture. When you look at the Bible, it doesn't talk about names of organizations. No, only with the name of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the Word of God. And there are many expositions that I've been I've given with with Scripture. And they will continuously be made into books because it only talks about Jesus Christ. And because it's all in the Bible, if you hear something else through scripture, then you have to ask yourself this question. And so when I, when I was in seminary, this, my, the seminary that I went to, they studied Calvinism, and it was all about doctrine and organization. And so I was trained for that. I already knew that. And so when I was thinking about how I should preach and give a sermon, I met a pastor of another church who trained Script, who, who would train pastors to give messages based on scripture or give scripture exposition. So from then, I, from Martin Luther, until from the first day until now, I only give messages based on the Bible, on scripture. May you have pride in the pulpit of Yewon Church. And as evidence of that, you should gift the expositions that have been published to others because doctrine-wise, system organization-wise, it's all based on scripture. And so you, you will be victorious and you'll come to life only when you base your life on scripture if you're busy listening to what others say and what they say then how can you be victorious in your life through today's worship may you may you 
completely align yourself centered on the Word of God and live a biblical walk of faith. Last week, through the One More Evangelism campaign, there were many long-term absentees and short-term absentees who came. And I said that it is your first life's priority to restore Sunday worship. And so no matter how dire the situation, no matter how desperate the situation, you must not lose hold of coming before God and worshiping Him. And that's why you must make that your top priority of life. The reason is right here. It is because it is the time to gain the strength to take the right direction spiritually and to take on covenant challenges. And with worship, you will heal everything. And so they say it takes about three days for the memory of human muscles to retain that memory. So no matter how well or no matter how fit someone is, if they do not work out for three days, then they'll forget. The body will forget that. And that is why athletes repeat the same exercise without taking a single day off. That must be the same spiritually. And so when it comes to the Word of God, just because you sit down and you, you pretend like you're listening to the Word, but then what do you actually remember? What do you remember from last week? What do you remember from last month? You've forgotten everything. Throughout the week, may you repeatedly listen to the Word. And so when I had gone from... When I was trying to pioneer this church, all I did was uh, think about the word continuously. That's how I started to change. The word came into me and it became my imprint root and nature so that all my prayers and all my conversation may be only about the word so that when I, ha I would not talk about other things, but I would only talk about the word of God. And when you repeatedly listen to the Word of God, that becomes your nature, that becomes your ideology, that becomes your habit. And so it is bound to give influence, the influence of the gospel. And that is why having success in worship is this important. Today's message is entitled, A Life Within Grace. The expression grace is an important expression that makes Christianity Christian. Without the absolute grace of God, we cannot exist. And without Christ, we have nothing to boast about. Without the grace of God, we're nothing. And that is why Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 10 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. It was by the grace of God. Everything was the grace of God. That's what Apostle Paul confesses. May this confession become our confession. One of the important banners, the themes of the Reformation was sola gratia. It's only grace. Only grace. It's only grace. And that is why when you give a confession of faith, and you have conversations, what you must always talk about is sola gratia. It was only by the grace of God, so you have nothing to put forward about yourself. And so do you talk about your own thoughts when you're living by God's grace? Only by God's grace. And 
And so what we must remember is that we are within the grace of God. And so no matter what we others say, we are God's children. We are God's children. What does it mean to be a child of God? It means that we are subjects of His special attention. Even though you might think they're living average lives, you are spiritual VIPs. Your identity is different. It's just that you don't use your authority that's been given to you, but you have been given a tremendous authority. You have been given the authority to cast out demons, to, to have world evangelization. But Satan makes it so you might forget that. And so what this means is that we live a completely guaranteed life. And so to have Christ in me, that is all. You have everything. Amen? You have everything. Christ is in you. He is with you with the Holy Spirit. That's all. Everything is at the end. What more are you trying to have? What more are you so desperate for? That's what unbelievers do. If you have Christ, you have everything. And so, but unbelievers, they have everything, yet they're still thirsty for more. Even if they have a billion dollars, they still need more. They still lack something. Jesus said that the water you give me, you will thirst again. But the water I give you, you will never thirst again. We've been given everything. Do not be deceived. Oh, because I'm lacking? Yes, we are lacking. But that is why we need God's grace. However, because you have Christ, you already have everything. Everything is in Christ Jesus. May you confess this every day and live a life that enjoys the guaranteed blessing. What has been guaranteed? The problem of death. We have the ticket to go to heaven. And even if we die today, it's heaven for us. Isn't that so? We already have this. And our citizenship is in heaven. We are citizens of heaven. And he, he, we have been guaranteed so we may live confident lives. So whether you recognize this and are conscious of this will polarize and determine the quality of your life. The Israelites who weren't able to recognize that they were in God's absolute grace what happened to them? They were especially chosen. Only the descendants of Abraham were chosen. Yet they didn't know whether they were chosen or not. Even despite being chosen, especially whenever there was a problem or event, they complained, grumbled, and resented God. And Moses was taken aback by that. Even if they were just a little bit uncomfortable, they would continuously grumble so in the end they became enslaved captive and colonized even now Israel that was Israel that was called to share the gospel they ended up killing all their prophets that God sent even Christ and so even to this day they're continuously in battle in war when boys become 16 years old they have to go to the military and they always carry around guns with them is that really living even today you know this even right now, there are rockets that are going back and forth. <coughs> they are wandering. However, we must not follow this path. Through today's word, may you experience the new grace that God pours upon you. 
May that grace flow beyond you personality, personally, personally, and flow into your homes, work, place of business, regions, academic fields, and even to our remnants. And may it continuously enlarge the place of both your spiritual and physical life. Number one is the advocate Christ. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. If you look at today's passage, Apostle John reveals one of the purposes for writing 1 John, and that was to prevent the early church members from sinning. Do not sin, it says. However, what is unique in this passage is that as soon as these words are finished, the Apostle John says, what will happen to, to if you do commit a sin? He immediately goes on to say it. And there is a reason why John said this. In fact, humans cannot avoid sinning because we have a flesh. There is no way for us to avoid it. Oh, that person, I wish I, that person was dead. That's already murder. Also, you could, you know, once in a while, not like someone. Oh, no, I just don't like that person. To think that, that is already considered murder. And if you look at, at another person with lust, that is adultery. Because we live with the flesh, there is no way for us to avoid sin. Because we are descendants of Adam. Therefore, until the day that we, the day we stand before the Lord, we are under construction under construction. Although we have been justified and become righteous, we are still unstable and imperfect beings. However, what we must not lose hold is that J Apostle John emphasized that we should not be bound to sin just because we have committed it. The biggest obstacle to spiritual growth that shackles us in this walk of faith, why is it that our faith, our, our faith does not grow? Is because of the sense of condemnation, because of the, of the sin that you might have committed in the past. That's seized you completely. And so, because of that one mistake that you might have made in your past, no one knows about it, but only you, you know it. But yet you're completely seized by that. You're con you feel oppressed by that, and because because you're so oppressed by that, and you're captivated by that condemnation, even if others tell you otherwise, you still don't believe them. The Bible said that God, the Christ, did not come for the righteous, but for the sinners. So what is Satan's specialty? It is con condemnation. And so individuals who've sinned themselves, they're just waiting for others to fall. And as soon as others fall, they condemn them. They judge them. Even if they've sinned all they want, but they think that no one else knows. So Satan condemns, and those who are seized by him also condemns others. They condemn themselves, they condemn others. And so someone who has, who it was loved by their parents and who's only seen their parents love each other, don't really know how to argue because all they've seen is how their parents are, how parents, how their, their parents love each other. So they do not know what fighting is. <clears throat> and so, I, so when this one encourager said, oh, she's never seen people fighting or she's never fought. And so she said, she's never fought before. And I said, what? I always fight. 
How can that be possible? But she's always at peace. You condemn yourself, condemn others. You're just making it a hell for everyone. Even to the point where you come to church and you continuously condemn the church. They say, oh, I wish Yeon Church would just disappear. And you just want the church to become completely be divided. That's what the devil wants. And so for the devil, it is frustrating how Yewon Church is always so focused on trying to fulfill the last commandment of Jesus and why we are so noisy about missions and evangelism. All the devil wants is for us to stay quiet. I think even if I were Satan, I'm, that might be the same case. to try and dissemble the church that God has put together. He de desires for things to not work out for the church. That is Satan's strategy. Can we see Satan? Is Satan a person? He is a spiritual being. We must not live a life of a sense of condemnation but live under a sense of grace remember that we are living within grace I am who I am only by the grace of God that is what the Apostle John reveals and a life within grace is not something that works out work works out with the efforts of man But it is only possible by through Jesus Christ and by the grace of God. And that is why we must always hold on to the advocate Christ. An advocate literally means one who speaks on one's behalf. John emphasizes that not anyone can become such an advocate, but only the righteous Jesus Christ. An advocate. Jesus Christ. An advocate is called parakletos in Greek. It is a unique term that only appears in this book and the Gospel of John. It means helper. And what helper means, it means a defender, comforter, collaborator, and advocate. Jesus Christ is my defender, and he is my comforter, he is my collaborator. Jesus Christ knows our weaknesses and shortcomings all too well. He knows all of them, and he defends us before God and protects us before God, all our weaknesses, even at this time, in this moment. He calls upon each and every one of your names. And when you pray, God has no choice but to hear it. And no matter how much Satan accuses us, he tries to accuse us and he tries to report us. But Jesus is on the right hand of the throne. And Jesus, he defends us on the throne. And he always wins. Why? Because in the court of heaven, why is he always? Why does he always win 100%? If Jesus simply says the words, "Blood of atonement on the cross," God has no choice to make but to make the judgment of forgiveness. No questions asked. Even if it's a murder, even if it's a prostitute, to have been saved by believing in Jesus Christ. If Jesus says. Remember the blood I shed, then God has no choice but to forgive. In Revelation 12 10, it is revealed the authority of Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. 
So there was an accuser who accuses us day and night, but Jesus came and threw them out. And in verse 11, it shows that what breaks the power of Satan is the blood of the Lamb and the Word of God. The blood of the Lamb, the blood of the cross. Satan knows that his time is short, so he attacks more and more. Europe has already closed its doors when it comes to churches. Germany, where the Ref Protestant Reformation began, has completely turned away. It, does, it no longer lives according to the scripture. It, it's, and that has spread to the UK, to America. The United States and Korea are where the churches are, have, are still present. But even to this day, it is continuously under attack. And many churches are closing their doors in both America and Korea. And that's why Jesus said, He said, will there be any uh, those who believe when I return? They continuously attack because the t time is not left. Much time is not left. And so, if we, if we were to call upon the name of Jesus Christ, Satan cannot touch us. And so the Apostle John reveals that the Prophet Jesus Christ is the peace offering for us. A peace offering refers to an offering offered to God to prevent God's wrath for human sins. And this peace offering contains the core and essential issues of Christianity. God is just. And so he, with an accurate justice, if he was to judge according to his righteousness and, and justice, then all mankind would have had to face eternal destruction. But God loves us. So he loves us, but still we must satisfy God's justice. So we have to be forgiven of our sins. And that is why in the end, the only way to forgive human sins was through Jesus Christ, the sinless, sinless Son of God, and for him to bear the cross for us. Other than that, it is impossible. The one and only way for us to be able to satisfy God's justice is Christ, the blood of Christ, the peace offering. And so it is only the blood of Christ that cleans us, that cleanses us. It cleanses us. And so you must repent every day that through the blood of Christ, may you be cleansed of all your sins. And so if we confess our sins and we call upon the name of Jesus, he cleanses us of our sins. If you look at Hebrews 7, 27, it says he has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily for, for his own sins and then for those of the people since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. And so in the Old Testament, the high priest would take upon the sacrifices that were brought by the people for to cleanse the the sins of the people first for themselves and for the people and so during festivals they because a lot of people would come or a lot of the people would return during the diaspora so many lambs were slaughtered that there would be almost like 250,000 lambs that were slaughtered during these festivals or feasts where all the Israelites would return and so then the temple would 
be covered in blood. That's what they practiced in the Old Testament because that was their way of being forgiven of their sins. But the blood of Christ finished this once for all. He fulfilled it. And so through the sacrifice of Christ, we're able to come however we want to church. This is the biblical offering, biblical worship. Through the precious life of Christ, we are able to enjoy this fellowship with God. And that life is a life that communicates with Jesus every day. And so the deeper our the deeper our communication with God is, the more we enjoy true freedom. In Christ Jesus, we have been given this true freedom, but yet people are so cap they're still taken captive, they're bound by their own sins, but you no longer have to live that way because Christ has already finished all of that. Many people live a life where not Christ is the master of their life, but they are the own master of their life, and that is why they become oppressed by that. They're co constantly under stress, and they're oppressed. But we must live a life of a supporting character when it comes to life that reveals Christ. Because if you're only a supporting character, you don't need to worry, because when you play a supporting role, you don't... All you need to do is just Enjoy, because Christ takes upon the lead role, taking responsibility for everything. And so, you all you need to do is live a happy life. And so, you know, I have such a harsh accent because of my accent. And so, I sometimes pray to God, God, may you give me a more softer tone. You know, my personality itself it needs to either be, it, things need to be either be hot or either cold. I don't drink any lukewarm water, but, you know, so I think sometimes people might misunderstand my passion for anger, but it's not. And point number two, a life lived by grace. If we keep, and by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. When you look at the contents of today's passage, the Apostle John might seem like he's con constantly emphasizing action, but what you must look at carefully is that it does not require mandatory action. You must look carefully at the order of actions. A person whose peaceful relationship with God is restored through Jesus Christ will naturally move towards grace. They will naturally move towards grace. And so today's, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about how we must, we must keep the word of God, keeping his commandments. But when many people approach this passage, they take a legalistic approach. They think like a Pharisee, but that misses the core, the essence. Because if you look at Matthew 22, verses 30, 34 to 40, a lawyer asks Jesus the following question. He asks, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus responds, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. What is the core of the commandment that God has given to us? To love God and to love our neighbors. That's it. So examine yourself. Do I really love God? And do I love my neighbors, my church members, my relatives? Do I really love all of them? All you need to do is that. Love God and love your neighbors. That's the end of the God's commandment. Loving God, loving your neighbors. So, in other words, through that communication you have with God, you taste His love, and you also share that love that you've tasted to your neighbors. Oh, God loves me so much. And because He has solved all problems, and because I've received this love from God, I share this love with you. And so those who receive God's love, Keep his word, keep his commandment, and share it. 
that is a life that saves souls. How can you know that whether someone loves God or not? How will you love God? How will you love your neighbors? So just because you, you say you love Him or you give a little bit of money, that's something unbelievers even do. Listen carefully. What is the pivotal, decisive aspect of loving God and loving your neighbors? It is to save souls. Whoever you meet. Today, it was on the news. There was uh, this one family whose in-laws lived in, who, who, were, who was a shaman. And so this individual went to, to evangelize their in-laws. And they were saved. Do you know what that is? That is loving God and loving your neighbors. This individual went to the flesh and bone evangelist team and asked to come and evangelize them. The core of keeping God's word and God's commandment is to see another soul being revived. If you look at verses 5 and 6 in today's passage, the apostle Paul, uh, John says, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. What well, was the crooks in Jesus' life? Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And so we must do the same as Jesus has done. What was Jesus' commandment? It was only the saving of souls. It was all about saving souls. To live in Christ, all they need to do is to live according to what Jesus said and what Jesus had done. And so why is it that Jesus had to undergo so much suffering, so much shame and pain? It was only one thing because that was to save souls, to give eternal life. To give eternal life. And so it says in John 10.10 10, that the death, the The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly to, for, so that they might have life and have it abundantly. That's what Jesus says. May you not complain about this or try to argue it. You might say, oh, but still, no, that, those are things that the devil says. May you make the choice that saves lives. That life is a life that, God, that delights and pleases God the most. And with that, you're able to evangelize. You're reaching and do world evangelization. So today afternoon from 2 p.m., a 2 million believer alliance service and a great prayer meeting will take place in the Gwangamun area to resist against legislation. All Korean churches will unite, and I encourage everyone to join voluntarily after the service. This gathering will not be a political demonstration, but will be held for the cause of us. Will, will be a time for all the Korean churches to come together and pray together. And so we're coming together to pray that the anti-discrimination law may not pass. The term anti-discrimination looks good on the surface, but it is in fact a law that encourages and advocates homosexuality that is contrary to God's word. And it will also prevent us from saying that only the Bible, only the gospel is the way. We won't be able to do anything with that. It is Satan's strategy to stop this biblical evangelist movement. This will completely bind us surprisingly it's all the all the uh, developed countries that have passed these laws if we say that only the gospel is the truth only the bible is the way the christ is only the way then people can be fined for that the gravest problem is that our descendants will be directly affected now the special 
Act for Students' Right Protection is proposed in the National Assembly. So what that means is that it means that, oh, schools should allow children to be able to express their sexuality however they want. And so if guys want to meet, be with guys and hold guys and kiss each other, that should be okay. That's what it's trying to say. And so I was passing by. There was this male who had, who, who was a very manly man who had a beard and he was kissing this other man. And both males had this beard on their face. And there was a flag in the entrance of that region saying that this was a gay town. This is also what's happening in our nation. And so if this law is passed, then our remnants, our children, how will they see the Bible? They will see it as a book of hate. As God, it will see it as anti-human, anti-rights. In the end, it leads to the consequence of disconnecting the next generation and the church. And like I said in Judges, it will become a completely different generation. It will be a time that has nothing to do with the Word of God, nothing to do with the Bible. And even to this day, many people laugh when it comes to, they mock the Bible. And so people say, especially elites, when they say, oh, you should believe in the Bible, they say, what day and age is this you're that you're, you believe in the Bible? That's just history of the Israelites. They say, but that's what's going to happen to our next generation. There will be no such thing as the order of creation. But then therefore we must reform. May you always live a life that's led by grace. And may you live a life that's aligned with the principle and the order of creation. This is the conclusion. An American journalist conducted research on why a politician who was well communicated in normal or ordinary times turns into a president who never communicates and wields one power. And what was one of the major causes of that? It was that the moment someone becomes president, they put this human curtain from the moment they become president. So elected as president, their judgment is based on the information provided by acquainted people who surround them and they face limits and lack in the sense of reality. And this is not only the case in America, but commonly found in all nations. The South Korean president also has become is our even our Korean president is often called the pronoun of non-communication. They do not know what is going on with the people. They only hear limited things each day, but it's the same thing spiritually. If we do not, for us to not be able to receive God's grace, Satan puts this curtain of unbelief so that we might judge and condemn others with that. And if that curtain is open, then we won't be able to do anything. We'll just live a naive and ambiguous life then there will be no spiritual growth. You must know the principle of spiritual growth. The grace of God must come upon you, and with that grace, you must live a life that is able to exert spiritual influence. You should be concentrating on the Word of God and the sense of grace. May you always seek receiving grace and receiving that grace. May you become the main figures of field transformation. Let us pray. 
Father God, all, may all y e o n believers starting today be able to concentrate on the Word of God. May they be able to look at what the Scripture says, and may they live a life that is within grace, and may they enjoy Jesus Christ, who always defends and protects us. May they live a life full of grace and full of peace. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.